Welcome, everybody. Hi. Hello. 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 Hey. Hello. Hello. So, hey, everybody. My name is Cal Sahoda. I am the VP of Possibilities with the Hero X team. I'm super excited today to be hosting our very first inaugural juniors webinar. So this webinar is related to our Lunar Lou challenge, which is about, yes, a toilet on the moon. So uh, a winner's webinar is an amazing opportunity for us to learn more about these fantastic, young, inspiring innovators. But quite frankly, it's also a really great way to um, celebrate you guys and learn more about your really amazing ideas. So uh, we have a few guests with us today. So how about we all start off with just some a quick round of introductions. Does that sound cool? Nods, thumbs up. Yes, yeah. all right, okay. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Should we put NASA on the hot seat first? Let's start with NASA, all right. Yeah, let's put NASA on the hot seat. Let's do it. Okay, ladies first. first. All right, Diane, let's first, start with you. Last. <laughs> hey everyone, I'm Diane Detroit. I work in Washington, D.C. for NASA, um, and I'm part of the team that looks for opportunities uh, to, for students to engage with NASA. We look for opportunities to fund um, universities. We look for opportunities to fund museums. Um, but the most exciting thing that we do are, are challenges like this that give students the chance to really showcase their creativity. Um, so that's what I spend my day doing, is, is looking for ways for all of you to engage with NASA. Good stuff. Thanks for taking the time, Diane. And who goes next? All right, Tuna, you're up next, my friend. Hi, I'm Tuna. I'm the project manager for this challenge, um, but my day job is working on the Lunar Lander program. Uh, so that's to get the first woman and the next man back to the South Pole of the Moon by 2024. So we're working with uh, our commercial partners, SpaceX, the Blue Federation team, and Dianetics to build up their lunar lander capabilities to take those two astronauts to the moon in uh, just under four years. And so we knew we needed a toilet for this. So we thought we'd see what you guys could come up with. Good stuff. Thanks, Tina. All right, Mr. Rader, you are up next. Hey, Steve. Hi. Uh, so my name is Steve Rader, and I work uh, in Houston, Texas, where the Mission Control Center is. And I actually help lead a group that uh, works across all of NASA to help uh, our projects like the Lander Project that Tuna works on and the Orion program and other programs all around the agency to use crowdsourcing challenges. So we help kind of hook them up with uh, companies and communities like Hero X. Uh, and then run challenges because what we find is you guys have a lot of passion and a lot of great ideas and we want to make sure and tap into those. So, Good stuff. Thanks for being here, you guys. Um, and of course, we have our winning team. So uh, for introductions, I'm going to ask you guys to uh, share a little bit about kind of just introduce yourselves, your names, where you're physically located, and uh, maybe just tell us what time it is for you guys. That'll be kind of cool. So remember, we're gonna we're gonna do a screen share and walk you through um, your slides in a little bit. So this is more just about who you guys are. So sound good? Yes. Yeah. Not. Yeah. All right. Well, Zisa, yeah. you're up first, my friend. Why don't you do a quick introduction? Hi, my name is Zisa Kang Zisun. I am nine years old. And I'm located in Malaysia right now. And it's and, midnight. And it's, and it's over midnight. Over midnight. It's so past your bedtime, man. 12.06 a.m. So past your bedtime. Well, welcome, Zisan. Yeah, Thanks nope. for taking the time to hang out with us today. And we also have with us Joel. Hey, Joel. Hello. Hello. I'm Joel John Aaron. And um, I'm 10 years old. I live in St. Albans, UK. And the time here right now is 4, 6 p.m. No. What, what time is it again there? 4, 6 p.m. Ah, so not too bad for you. So this is your afternoon. You're all right then. You're good. 
All right. So moving on to Team India. So, uh, Ridanshu, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ridhyanshu, and I'm currently uh, uh, in Delhi, India, and it's approximately around 9.40 here. Uh, I'm actually quite interested uh, in physics and particularly about cosmology. So it's uh, I feel proud to be here on this platform. Good stuff. All right, let's see if I can do this. Um, Aditya, should we go with you yeah, first? Absolutely. <laughs> this is pretty close. <laughs> so, uh, hi all. <laughs> I am Aditya Khandia. Um, I also live in Delhi, India. And like you said, it's 9.40 for us right now. And good to be here. Very yes, happy. Yeah. These guys are the only team. Everybody else is individuals. So uh, Madhav, you want to go next? Yeah. Hi guys, I'm Madhu Sharma. I recently turned 15 and all of us are from India and it's it's night over here and I'm really proud to be over here. I've been following NASA's projects for the past five years and I'm really, really interested in how astronomy works. Good stuff. Future astronaut perhaps? Let's see. Um, Kashav, tell us a little bit about you and obviously you're in India. We know what time it is. So sorry, I should have prefaced that a little bit. So just tell us about you. Hi, I'm Keshav and I'm in Delhi, as you said, and I'm really interested in the designing aspect of various fields. And yeah, I would like to pursue product designing or industrial designing. Amazing. Himanshu, round us off. Uh, right, I'm Himanshu Sharma and similar to everyone I hear from Delhi, India. I study in grade 10th in Amity International School, Saket. And I'm interested in various designing and uh, space settlements. And uh, I also participated in NASA, uh, the space settlement design competitions. And this inspired me to participate in the Lunar, uh, Lunar Loo Challenge. Good stuff. All right, welcome Team India. All right, last but certainly not least on our more senior category, we have Edison with us. Hey, Edison. Hello, and um, I'm Edison, not Thomas though. Uh, I'm 15 years old and I'm currently in year 11. I currently live in Hong Kong and I'm really interested in forensics and science and really want to con contribute to the scientific community as a general. I like to build, plan things, kind of program and fiddle with stuff. It's currently around midnight as well. Good stuff. Way past your bedtime too. That's okay. You're a little bit older. You'll be just fine. All right. So excellent. Wonderful to meet you all. Um, to our audience, we're really, you know, if you're not present to it, I'm really present to the fact that all of these guys are from so many different corners of the world. So it's just so incredible to see where all the creativity lives in every corner of the world. We also have with us here today, our CEO and co-founder, Christian Caraccini. Hey, Christian, so why don't you share a little bit um, with the winners about who you are? Sure. But, um, I want you to get started by telling them what you wanted to be when you grew up. And we're going to go under the understanding that you're grown up. <laughs> I'm, I'm semi grown up. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you. So yeah, um, well, when I wanted to grow up, I wanted to be an astronaut. Big there surprise. I know. Um, I also wanted to learn how to play the violin. So neither of those worked out too well. <laughs> But um, no, my name is Christian Cotaccini. I'm the co-founder and CEO of HeroX. Really excited to be here today and um, just learn what you guys, see your guys' creative ideas and um, learn what you guys are up to. That's awesome. And uh, we love the, the power of crowdsourcing challenges and uh, seeing um, organizations like NASA share these problems um, out with the world and invite anybody to work on real problems, real mm -hmm. problems that involve real missions. It's very cool um, to see people tackle these types of problems. And we, we really love these kinds of projects on HeroX. Good stuff. Well, welcome. Thanks for being here today, Christian. And you know what? You did a beautiful job of segueing the next kind of segment of what we're up to, which is, so before we chat with the winners, let's learn a little bit more about the project itself. And some basic foundational facts, which I'm sure a NASA team will speak to and many of you guys that are listening are already familiar with. 
Um, but NASA is incredibly supportive of STEM curriculum, which is based on the idea of educating students in four specific disciplines, which is science, technology, engineering, and of course, mathematics. And the approach is um, rather than teach the discipline separately, it kind of combines everything. And the cool part is that, you know, you work on real world applications and how much more real world are you really going to get than solving a problem for NASA? So it ties beautifully into STEM, which is why we really wanted to support and um, not only have a separate category for the juniors, but also have this separate webinar to really showcase your guides. So, um, okay, so perfect. So why don't we learn a little bit more about the project itself? So Diane, Tuna, why don't you offer us a little bit of an overview? And if you wanna maybe talk a little bit about the prizes, that's entirely up to you guys as well, but let's get a little bit of background. Sure, so when we were looking at um how to build a toilet for the, the lunar lander. We had some constraints that uh, make it uh, not viable to use the toilets we have that are really capable already, but just are a little bit too big or, or um, too heavy for what we need for ours. So we wanted um, as the NASA team to lean into that innovation and outside ideas to, to look to the crowd for, for some out of the box thinking and stuff like that. And we knew you know, as part of trying to inspire the Artemis generation that a lot of kids would be excited about this project. You know, there's a book out there about everybody poops. So we knew this was a topic that uh, <laughs> kids could relate to compared to, you know, other more hardcore engineering and stuff like that. So we brought in Diane's team from the education office to, to really um, help shepherd us through engaging the kids and finding a good way to um, make this a fun project for them, as well as thinking about what, what does it take to, to use a toilet um, for the lunar lander and stuff like that. So we gave them the same hard constraints as the technical team, but uh, obviously we expected more creativity and out of the box thinking uh, for this. So Diane, anything you wanna add from the education side? Yeah, for, from my side, it's just, we're always looking for creativity and ingenuity um, like Michael has talked about. And, and we know that students like yourselves often come up with that kind of spark of ingenuity that we may not have thought of. Um, it brings, new ideas to life. Um, and as Tuna said, you know, with the Artemis program, we're looking at putting the, the first woman and the next man back on the moon in 2024. And that's, it's, it's close, but you know, there's still a lot of ingenuity that we've got to bring to the table. And I was just, we were just really pleased when um, um, Cal and the Hero X team and, and Tuna and the technical team came to us and said, hey, we want to get students involved in this. And that just thrilled us because, like I said, this is just something that we always look forward to is getting students involved in anything they can do to think about the future of space and how that's going to um, help mankind, humankind. Good stuff. So uh, thanks for that overview, you guys. So let's talk a little bit about these incredible, uh, the incredible number of submissions that we actually receive. So um, in fact, to be exact, I think we received about 887 submissions from 85 different countries, you guys, all over the globe is where you guys are located. Um, Diane, tell us a little bit about your actual experience judging these submissions. I mean, it couldn't have been easy. Well, yeah, and I and I have to compliment uh, the great team of talented judges that I that came together to help on this. We we brought judges together from across NASA to look at all the students. Um, submissions and it and it was a real challenge and I tell you it was an honor to look at some of your submissions. Um, it was tough to identify the ones that really stood out. There were lots of clever ideas, really great descriptions, um, and some really thoughtful presentations about your designs and we worked really hard to, to pick the ones that we thought really stood out um, and that's really uh, a compliment to all of you and the and the work you've done and the creativity with your designs. Um, and I know um, in the world we're all living in right now with COVID mm -hmm. and the pandemic that it might've been particularly challenging uh, to do this, especially for uh, the team in India to, to, to work together. So um, I really applaud you for your diligence um, and determination. Um, and really now I'm excited to, to welcome you as part of the Artemis generation because you're here mm -hmm. and you're helping us um, get back to the moon. So thank you. You guys hear that? 
your guys, all your entries were reviewed by so many people in NASA, including astronauts. So astronauts actually looked at your guys' uh, entries. So how cool is that? Very um, cool. Very cool. There he is. Um, yeah, very so cool. <laughs> so Tuna, you had um, the pleasure of actually working on, so again, a little bit of background. Um, so this challenge was hosted two different ways. So we had a main category, technical category, and then we also had a sub kind of junior category and that's kind of where you guys participated. So Tuna, you participated in both. What surprised you uh, the most about the submissions? Uh, ju just the level of detail that some of these folks put into it. I mean, you know, just cause you're young, don't don't discount that you don't have the knowledge to, to, to come up with ideas like this. I mean, there are some ideas here that are, very similar to what bubbled up as top contenders on the technical side. And, you know, if some of you folks were a little bit older, you, you could have been in the running for the, the big prize money um, there because you had some really great ideas there. And so it just shows that even though you're young and you may not have, you know, a world of engineering background or whatever, it's because you don't have those blinders on, mm -hmm. you can just approach the problem from a completely, you know, open-minded approach and, and come up with some really great ideas. So the creativity and everything was, was outstanding and, and like I said you know some of these were really impressive in terms of the level of detail the the presentations and the videos and and everything and the thought that went into it that you know they they were very highly ranked and you know looked well compared to even some of the technical contenders so job well done good stuff so you guys have so much to be proud of you didn't even realize um so should we put you guys on the hot seat no I'm kidding we won't put you on the hot seat. Well, we are going to learn a little bit more about these rock stars. All right. So I'm going to do a screen share now. And I um, thought we'd start a little really quickly, kind of give some additional background to the audience. So who the heck is Hero X? So Hero X, so we're the platform where the actual challenge was hosted. So we had the pleasure of working with the NASA team since June to get it launched and created. And this is how it looks on the website itself. And you see the two different categories. So if you guys have some technical questions that you wanna ask still, you can um, jump right in and you can you know, post them in the forum here. The one thing that I do wanna to, to offer you guys is this, it's a little bit of an elephant in the room, Diane. Do you know what that would be? And it's, you know what, there were a lot of young ladies that also won, but uh, we could only, uh, just, just the sheer number of people that we would have to have on the webinar, we kind of limited it to the, the first prize winners for each of the categories. But when you guys take a look in the community, you guys can see there's Grace here, there's, you know, all these, there's Daisy. So there's multiple winners here, so. We're just showcasing the first prize in each of the categories. So, all right, you guys, let's go ahead and let me start presenting. Okay. Zeeson, my friend, you are up first. Okay. So, Tell hi, my name. I didn't know what. Okay. Just tell me when you Hi, want me to switch your slide, okay? Hi, my name is Zeeson Kanzi Soon. I am nine years old. I live in Malaysia and it's about midnight. Yeah. And my product is called Space Suit Luna Toilet. Next slide. Next slide. This one good or one more? Next. Next one, okay. So, what's my next inspiration? Do you want to do this one first? You want to talk about your inspiration first? Let's do that first. Does that work? My inspiration. What I, what I'm passionate about? Yeah. Uh, space, automotive vehicles, and genetic engineering. Very cool. And what do you want to do when you when you I grow up? I wish to be a successful geneticist. Very cool. 
good stuff. So you want to talk a little bit? Yeah, you did it perfectly, my You're friend. You're interested in the study of bringing back the extinct species, biogenetics, and paleogenetics. That's because sometimes you say uh, this species is this species and that species is that species, but sometimes it can be together, the same species, but we didn't know that. And that's what you're going to work on when you get when, older. So when you bring them back, resurre resurrect them, you can realize, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> I just looked at the skeleton and I didn't look at what is what is it what does it look like and and you think that's a real species but sometimes it's just not very cool and, and and actually there's something in the movie Jurassic World that inspired me this in the 2000 movie Jurassic World itself mm -hmm. The Jurassic World's Hammond Creation Lab in the Innovation Center okay. on Main Street in, has a lot of cool, cool technology inside and to clone to clone those dinosaurs and bring them back to life with Dino DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Mister DNA said in 1993 film. Yeah, no, DNA. <laughs> so do you want to tell us a little bit about your your idea? Yeah. What you submitted. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, my pleasure to share. My project is called Space Suit Lunar Toilet. It is a personalized and mobilized type of lunar toilet. A syringe pump is attached to the space boot. The vacuum container is attached to the space suit pan pocket. It doesn't require electric power to operate it. It does need a connected mechanical power. When the astronaut is ready to peep or poo, they just need to unzip and put the bowl device to their genital part. Once he or she is done, he or she can start to push down the syringe pump to create vacuum power. The waste will be transferred to the vacuum chamber to store and crystallize by hydrogen. When it's full, they can just replace with a new vacuum container. That's all for my design concept, but not just that. Now, this, this design can not only be used on the moon, it can be used as the medical toilet. Since now we're in pandemic, you can sometimes even the doctors and nurses need to pee or poo, so they can just Work out when they pee or poo. Sometimes when even doing like like you're saving people and you want to pee, you can't just go away like that. So you just need to pump it down like that. Good stuff. You can also help those doctors and help the nurses, not just only for astronauts. Good to know. Do you have another slide or is this the last one, Zeeson? Last one. This is the last, last one. one. I think. All right. So why don't you tell us uh, when you're not when you're not training to, to be this amazing scientist and all this other stuff, what do you like to do in your spare time? Sometimes the Legos. Ah, uh, very cool. I love it. Actually, Legos. I have a YouTube channel. I actually have a YouTube channel. You do. Very cool. So we'll have to yes. check that out. Why don't you post that in the chat and we can all check it out later. Does that sound good? Mm. I think my comments are turned off. Okay. Okay. Got it. So maybe you can. Well, just I just need me. to check it back. That's okay. You send me the email afterwards. How's that sound? I'd love to look at your YouTube. Okay. Good I'll stuff. Do it. I'll do it. <laughs> Thanks, Ethan. You did a really good job. Thank you. All right. So up next, we have Joel. Hello. Hello. You ready to go, Joel? Yes. Good stuff. Next slide. Okay. 
My name is Joel John Aaron and I just turned 10 last Sunday. Um, I'm in year five and I go to St. Alban and St. Stephen's Catholic Primary School. And um, I live in St. Alban's, UK. Uh. <laughs> I love the picture. Superhero. Everyone loves one first. <laughs> That's because there's no planet with life now. <laughs> Till now, we never know. So let's talk my about your inspiration. My inspiration are some of the most, some of the earliest flying men like Otto Lilienthal and the Wright brothers and my dear family and teachers. I want, I would like to thank my grandparents um, and my family and my teachers for always supporting me. And a special thanks to my mom for, for, for telling me about this competition and encouraging me. I love you, mom. And I want to be an inventor when I grow up and live to be 125 years old. Wow. Pretty impressive. What if you hit 126? Yeah, okay that's that? even better. That's even better. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. So tell us a little bit more about your actual idea, Joel. Okay. My Luna Lou is called the Artemis Easy Lou or AEL in short. It looks like a horse's saddle and uses suction and sensors and one-way flaps and dirt sense. It's easy to use just like at home. Perfect. So, whoops. So I'm going all over the place. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Is there anything else you wanted to share about your idea, Joel? Um, yes, please. So, so my Lou, it uses um, it it uses sensors which which can detect excrement um, that the astronaut does, and the sensors do do most of the work. So when the sensors detect all any of the waste that the astronaut puts when using the toilet, it turns on the suction which pulls the one-way flaps open and sucks the excrement into the tubes. The suction ensures it works in both lunar and microgravity. As all the space toilets that have been to space use suction. Good stuff. And that's it. And that's it. It's a wrap. All right. So I'm um, going to ask you a question. How about you tell me? Um, obviously, you're super smart. That part we got. What's your favorite TV show? or Netflix show, or whatever you guys mm -hmm. watch these days? My favorite TV show is Yu-Gi-Oh. Yu-Gi-Oh. Very cool. It's about these monsters and cards, and it's basically a game. <laughs> Got it. Got it. So, I, I, you know what? I can't, uh, I can't help myself. So, Steve, I'm going to ask you. When you were growing up, what was your favorite TV show or cartoon? Oh, gosh. Uh, it's been so long. <laughs> I I uh I remember really loving Sesame Street. That was oh yeah yeah Sesame Street still around. Very cool. I was more of a Mighty Mouse and Tasmanian Devil kind of a girl, and and I'm still a bit of a kid. I still watch Little Bear sometimes. I don't know what that says about me, but there you go. So moving on to ages. So the next category is 11 to 14, and the top winning um, selection for this one was actually a team. So this was the first, the actual, uh, everybody else is individuals. These guys are a team. They are from India, and you guys have met them all already. So you guys are up. So I'm, I'm assuming we're going to move past this. All right. So you guys want to share a little bit about your inspiration? Yeah, so Elon Musk was our biggest inspiration, essentially, because all of his uh, works in SpaceX and rock, rocket designing and all. So uh, he was a big motivation to all these, uh, all the projects and this project especially. Good stuff. Now, was that true for all of you guys or did do some of you guys have different inspirations? Definitely all of us idealize different people, but the one person we can all relate to is Elon Musk because his ideas sound so crazy and, and we never expect him to actually 
fulfill those ideas but when he does it's just so shocking for all of us like whenever we talk we're just yeah. like okay how how did you do that and uh, how did you guys how did you guys meet so are you so guys we go to the same school ah, okay yeah. okay and what school is that that's amity international school socket it's in new delhi very cool wonderful and how did you guys hear about the the challenge Yes, so our school posted this competition on their website. Okay. So we got it from there. Got it. Yeah. Okay, so you guys ready to share a little bit more about the actual um, idea itself, and just let me know when you want me to switch the slides, okay? Uh, right. So the structural overview contains six components: the menstrual and vomit waste storage unit. the air purification unit the functional unit that is the temporary storage the cylindrical commode uh, the permanent storage and the urine absorption unit and we'll be explaining one by one uh, next slide perfect uh, so the urine collection and storage system works on the principle of pressure differential which is generated by a vacuum pump which is in the middle section now the main components involved in this process are the urinal hose the urine absorption tank and the air purification unit the air purification unit primarily removes the odor harmful bacteria and microbes from air making it fit for breathing now this air is sent to the cabin so that air is regulated now this unit consists of a three fold system namely the chlorine dioxide treatment charcoal treatment and silica aerogel treatment and a vacuum pump at the end and this vacuum pump helps to suck the urine and the air the components of the entire system are connected by long pipe which is connected to the vacuum pump at the end as explained and the other end is the urinal hose the vacuum pump creates a suction pull throughout the pipe pulling the urine do- droplets the droplets pass through the polyvinyl foam for urine absorption and the air is separated from there air is then sent to the purification unit and then sent to the cabin we also have a integrated vomit storage and menstrual waste storage uh, which helps in uh, the disposal of menstrual waste and disposal of vomit right next um- slide so i will be talking about how our fecal systems work so first let me explain what the problem with this is for those of you watching whenever you use the washroom at your home you see the the flush works and the water takes all your feces down the drain but have you ever thought about why all the feces go down the drain and why don't they just splash on your face the reason is gravity the gravity as we all know pulls everything down but space is no gravity so the first issue comes at hand is how do we make a flushing system that die on gravity another issue is the current space toilet systems like the space toilet that is there on the international space station they are only calibrated to microgravity now microgravity is essentially um, the environment in space where there is no gravitational pull of a body but the problem stated that we need to create something that works in both microgravity and lunar gravity now lunar gravity has different calculations it has a different influence on the paths as compared to microgravity so the issue at hand was how do we calibrate our system so that it automatically adjusts to microgravity and lunar gravity so initially we were trying to make a system that is dynamic enough to recognize changes in gravity and calibrate itself accordingly but then we realized that a that is something that involves a lot of calculations which which we found that we are not capable to do and b it is something that would easily exceed the 70 watt energy limit that would that we were given so that would require a lot of energy it would be very expensive it would be very heavy so the solution that we have come up with is that we've created a system that works entirely on pressure differential this is something that we learn in high school physics that air moves from an area of higher pressure to lower pressure and using this one concept we have created a system that works uh, without any uh, dependence on gravity So the pump you see in the middle is a turbo molecular pump, and it consumes only 50 watts of power per use, which is well within the limit. And this pump creates pressure differentials accordingly, so that our feces can move from 
one area to another and the way we have created a flush is we have created a, a barrier of air over the feces so whenever someone is using the loo the barrier of air prevents the uh, feces from floating up because of the gravity like if you take a straw at your home and blow at a, blow at an ant then the ant moves behind similarly the air pushes all the feces towards the storage area we have also created a mesh so uh, at your home, like the current systems they have a churner and that churner churn, churns all the feces into smaller components so that it does not clog the drains however a churner requires energy so what we have done is we have harnessed the energy of the pump that we are using and using that momentum all our feces pass through a mesh and the mesh automatically churns all the feces into smaller components so that it does not clog our drain and this is explained in great detail in our project but the essential idea is you use pressure differentials alone and the airtight lid ensures that even when the cabin is depressurized like uh, the first question that must have come to your mind is ki that if it is working on pressure differentials then what happens when the cabin depressurizes doesn't all the air escape the toilet and doesn't our system become useless the answer is no because we have created an airtight seal over the entire system and each and every component of the system is sealed there is no opening in the system so even when the ca cabin is depressurized our our system functions properly next slide please okay uh, so for the contingency and the safety measures so first of all coming to the strapping mechanisms so we have used a few l shaped thigh locks which already exist and then there is a foot restraint now for people with different heights it can adjust in the y axis that is up and down and for people with different feet length it has a spring in it so it can expand and contract too so it's more more or less like a slip on shoe but it can with uh, adjustable to all person or people now other than that for the hygiene we have decided to keep a carbon nanofiber layer on uh, on the seat so that it is very hygienic and like mother said for the air tight lid so that the internal environment of the uh, toilet remains constant and then just so, so as to keep the genitals of people a bit safe there is a perforated funnel on the urine hose so that the pressure from the cabin actually does not allow your external extra force from the pressure from the toilet to actually destroy your genitals and other than that uh, uh, other than that there is another leak system something which uh, keshav is going to explain the pipe leak system is a two fold layering system which provides safety from any leakage that might take place in the pipes flowing urine or other biological waste products so we used the two uh, the two fold layering system the first layer had a uh, silica with polymer layer which hardens when pressure is applied so for example if the pipe leaks the pressure is applied in the first wall and it hardens uh, immediately and avoiding any further leakage the second layer is just for uh, in case the uh, the biological waste penetrates th through the first layer and it is very unlikely to that happen so the second layer is just polyvinyl formaldehyde foam which absorbs all the uh, biological waste product which might overflow next slide next slide okay um yes so now coming to the designing process we had thought that the design needs to be simple and compact but at the same time maintain its efficiency so one thing which we kept in mind while designing this lunar loo was that uh, that while reading uh, the current existing projects and reports we realized that the urinal hose which is there for women is actually in in quite a lot of designs very far so we thought that we can simply change its uh, a uh, position uh, so that uh, it so, uh, so that it also so that uh, it becomes good for the women uh, uh, while they are on the lunar loo 
Now coming to the designing process, there were uh, our main software was Autodesk Maya uh, with rendering being done in Arnold. We had used Substance Paint and Keyshot for, for showing how uh, about the texturing process and how uh, our Lunar Lou will actually look uh, when it is made. Apart from that, uh, we had used Fusion Static Pressure and Thermal Simulation results for deciding uh, the thickness and the position of pipes. So. And further, uh, in, while we do 3D modeling, there's a very fundamental concept of hard surface modeling, which is used when we are creating any sort of mechanical uh, object. So by using hard surface modeling principles, we have tried to show uh, all the details uh, so that it balances out uh, the mechanical and the creative aspects of the lunar loop. All right. That's it from our side. That's it from your side. You guys, honestly, so impressive. Just all the detail, all the soft facts, you guys covered it. Really, really honestly amazing. But you know, I have to ask, with so many of you guys on the team, how do you guys manage all the ideas? Is there a boss? Is there a team lead? How, how do you guys manage that? Uh, so we distributed all the work. Like I was managing the urinal and, uh, and the fecal uh, and the menstrual waste system. Madhav was managing the fecal system, and Aditya and Kesha were managing all the safety mechanisms and the contingencies. And once our designs mm -hmm. were finalized, we gave our designs to Ridyanshu, who did all the three D modeling and rendering. So we followed a step by step process. Very impressive. Ultimate teamwork, really, really well done. Good stuff. So, all right, you guys. So last but certainly not least, we have Edison. Edison, you there? Uh, hello. Hi. Um, so hello, I'm Edison and I'm currently 15 years old. I live in Hong Kong and some people might call me a nerd. <laughs> some, yeah, some people might call me a nerd. And I really dream of one day having my own lab that's something I'm really trying to invest in as well. Um, that owl in my photo I actually met in Japan. Pretty cool. Next slide. Wow. Please. I was going to ask you about that. Okay. Uh, so my inspiration or just just a person who inspired me in general was Professor Eric Lake Lekwith. I actually have no idea how to pronounce that. Um, <laughs> He was from Imperial College London. Some people may call him the father of Maglev. Um, he basically introduced me to proper physics. Mm -hmm. Even though he passed away around two decades ago, um, I learned a lot from his uh, lecture videos. Uh, he used a lot of um, analogies and he created a lot of mainstream analogies for magnetism, electricity and stuff like that. And I really enjoy his exuberant and enthusiastic teaching. It almost feels like he's right in front of me, although, you know, he's quite dead. Uh, <laughs> next slide. Okay. Uh, yeah. So this is my design and a bladed toilet, which is a pretty peculiar and deadly name. Um, so my, my design really works on the uh, pressure differential, the, the difference in pressure. And particularly the most crucial part of the design is the air blade nozzle. And it's used to create a um, conical vertex of a, of a blade of air, which uh, prevents excrement, urine, and other liquids, um, wastes from escaping the toilet. So um, once uh, the air flows through the uh, air blade nozzle, it gets into the augering system, along with the waste, liquid, solid, and whatever particle tissue paper maybe. And the auger churns everything up it sorts of make, mixes and separates it a little bit into more defined pieces. And it pushes every, everything along into the color receptacle, as I call it, which, ha which has uh, porous pores, which allows um, the air, which will be suctioned uh, through the system and the liquid as well to enter the uh, collar by capillary action and as well as uh, laminar flow. Through that, it goes into a uh, centrifugal fan separator in the picture three, and it uses uh, the centrifugal force to sling the waste outwards while the air is able to pass through a filter, a HEPA filter, which is then either exhausted to the environment or um, in, um, 
it goes back into the air blade system, which creates that vortex of air. And this system is really crucial because it allows the onboard computer to maintain a proper pressure ratio from suction and the formation of the air blade. And suction is really important because the only vector when defecating or urinating is the force of your body. So suction really helps to capture the waste while the air blade sorts, sorts of um, prevents any splashes or backflow of uh, fecal matter. So once the waste is uh, processed through the uh, peristaltic pump and all the filters, it goes into the storage system. Um, it's separated into two compartments and the urine is, um, the urine goes into a bag that expands. It's like a bladder, as I call it. It's filled with um, calcium hydroxide because it prevents the hydrolysis of urine into ammonia. And since ammonia is really a dangerous gas, so I really would like to prevent that from being emitted. And the reason why I didn't really choose to use any um, absorbent gel in that point is because I feel like that urine can be repurposed for uh, testing purposes. Astronauts might need to test their calcium deposits in the uh, urine. They might also wish to uh, reuse some of the water excreted uh, because water is very precious in space. And the fecal matter, the solid part of the waste, including uh, the defecated waste, digested waste, the menstrual waste, and everything else that's solid and kind of clumps together, goes through a spring seal into a sort of like a trash bag. And that trash bag really um, allows the um, calculation really, it just really um, kind of packed everything together. It's filled with iron, which absorbs oxygen. So that microbacteria, growth, pathogens, everything, they don't, they don't, they have no chance to grow inside of it, which is very crucial to keep the uh, cabin clean. And inside the uh, solid waste bag also has sodium polyacrylate, which is the hyper absorbing gel because you really want to get all the moisture out of the solid waste as soon as possible, because it's really a breeding ground for bacteria and everything you don't want in a space station. And the overall design, I wished it to be more compact. That's one of my main concerns that I didn't really address at that point, but yeah, um, that's about it, yeah. Good stuff, really well done, really well done. So that's it. That covers all of your guys' solutions. And, you know, I know we shared a little bit at the beginning, but honestly, just on behalf of NASA and HeroX, congratulations to all of you guys. I mean, you guys are honestly superheroes. It's just a job really well done. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop my okay. screen share. And that good stuff. So, um, you know what? NASA team, what are your initial thoughts? Like after hearing all the, the details, any one of you guys can jump in. Again, like I said up front, you know, it, it's pretty impressive. The, the, the ideas they came up with and, and the level of detail and design that they went through in terms of the CADs, um, you know, Zeissen building a prototype and all that. I mean, just, you know, we just hope just to get the kids excited about, you know, and maybe get like a couple of drawings out of them but you know we got full up cad from the team from india and stuff like that so it, it was very impressive and it was really tough on the judges i think dan will attest to of just coming up with the winners and and stuff like that um just because of the 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 effort that was put into this and and the the concepts are, are pretty viable yeah I, I was really floored by uh Kind of the analytics like how well you all thought about each part of the problem and then actually address that but i mean i was surprised i heard multiple of you talking about uh silica astrogel about you know uh, uh calcium hydrochloride uh, uh, material science uh you know uh hyper hyperphobic uh coatings like these are not things that just everyone understands about. And then you put on top of that, the fact that there was CAD work. Uh, Edison, your video, uh, like I, I assume you produced that yourself. That's just the capability to do that yep. video was pretty amazing. Uh, and you had some CAD work in there as well. Uh, really, I'm, I'm just really impressed, especially given how, how young you guys are, just how much you've learned the different tools uh, and knowledge necessary to put this together because these are 
These are really complicated things that require teams of experts that all know a little bit. And you guys have demonstrated that you understand how to address a problem and how to attack it. And I will tell you, we do a lot of challenges. And one of the things we find is when young people do these kinds of projects and take on applying what they're learning in school, are curious about how to make it better and bring all those elements together to apply them to a problem that you realize what you're capable of and that you're actually like we see a lot of students that go on to be entrepreneurs to start businesses to be researchers to actually be inventors and so uh, i'm really excited about what the start of this journey is for you guys so that's fantastic good stuff diane any immediate thoughts that show up for you i don't think I could add any more to what, no. what Tuna and Steve have said, other than I, I too was very impressed. Steve knows the technical side of what all that was, most of which I didn't understand, but I was, I was, you know, really impressed, Edison, with your video and the way you described your, your toilet and your device. It was something I could, I could understand. And then um, the, the team from India, I was really impressed with the way you addressed um, astronaut safety. That was that was that was, I was critically looking for that, and you guys really had a thorough explanation of that. Good stuff. So listen, we have a few minutes, and as I promised you guys, if we get through all of your presentations timely, we're going to play a bit of a game. All right, so let's play a game called Let's Ask NASA. So uh, we have a few minutes, so hopefully we can get to all of you guys. But if we don't, I'm going to ask for forgiveness in advance. So um, you got, it's just popcorn style. You guys know what that is, right? So whoever has a question, go for it. Go ahead, Joel. What was the most exciting experience you had? I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I've got two of them. Um, I was at the very first launch of the space shuttle and the very last launch of the space shuttle. Um, I went to some in between, but um, just having those bookends of being at the first and the last one. Um, and, and at the time when I was at the first one, I wasn't working for NASA at all. I wasn't associated with NASA at all. I just had a really cool opportunity to go. Um, that's one of my most memorable parts of working for NASA. Good stuff. Zeeson, you had your hand up as well. What's your question, my friend? Uh, why, why do you want to go to the moon again? <laughs> well, great question. So, uh, you know, as part of uh, our plan, it's not just go to the moon for flags and footprints. We're, we're going back to, to, to put that foothold there as a, a permanent uh, presence on the moon to start learning uh, what we need to learn um, for long duration stays away from the earth. We, we've got a great experience. Um, uh, next week is the celebration of 20 years of humans living continuously on the space station. So we've got a lot of experience there um, close to home. Now we need to start moving further out. And so setting up a permanent base on the moon allows us to start working on those unknown unknowns to think about um, how to live in a, in a partial gravity scenario, uh, deal with the radiation environment, start dealing with calm delays. There's a little bit of delay um, in terms of going back and forth uh, between mission control and the astronauts on the moon, uh, dealing with the dusty environment and all those lessons we can learn and then feed forward into when we talk about going to Mars uh, further down there. So we need to get that experience base of living away in that proving ground of the moon first and then move on to the thousand plus day missions uh, when we talk about going to Mars and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a good test bed to get ready to move on as we move further out into the expanse of the solar system. Good stuff. So, you, so you're saying that you're going to the moon to train to go to Mars. Yeah, yeah. Yes. it's a good training ground. It's a good lessons learned to test out some of the uh, hardware and software that we can then feed forward into technologies we need for going to Mars down the road. Okay. All right, yeah. good stuff. Mother. The moon lights the way to Mars as we like to say. <laughs> well said, I like that. 
So my question is a bit about panspermia. So as you said, we are planning to go to the moon in uh, as in under four years. But with the coronavirus still here, what happens mm -hmm. if one piece of equipment or one of the astronauts manages to get the coronavirus to moon? Um, there's no atmosphere on the moon, um, so that would you know help kill any microbial um, we bring with us. We're we're always worried about planetary protection in terms of uh, waste we leave behind. We scrub down the rovers before they leave for Mars and stuff like that to avoid any contamination there. I, I think the general philosophy is wherever the lunar lander lands, um, there's a certain region around that considered contaminated at that point by the, the lander and the crew working, and then everything else is still considered um, untouched um, or uncontaminated. So there is that potential if you discover something outside the landing zone that it, it is potentially something that was on the moon and not something we brought with us. But we are always cognizant about that planetary protection. I think we had a job opening not that long ago to, to be the planetary protection officer for the agency and stuff like that. So I applied for that. I don't know why I didn't get a call back. <laughs> Fortunately, you have to be a US citizen for uh, no, to work all right. That's kind of you that that was the only reason I didn't get a call. Uh, that's the only reason I'm sure that <laughs> held you up. Any other questions, you guys? I've got a question. Go ahead. Shoot. Um, so Will the returning astronauts to the moon go back to the Apollo landing sites in any chance? The initial plan is to do the south pole of the moon because that's where we're thinking um, there are the resources for long-term um, presence on the moon. So that would be sort of resource prospecting um, on those short duration scouting missions. But uh, long-term, I think once we start setting up a lunar base and have that permanent presence that we would go back and there's lessons to be learned about how uh, atomic oxygen, radiation, micrometeor has damaged those landing sites. And also there's the historical preservation of those sites just to try to preserve them and ensure that they're not disturbed uh, for a uh, long duration. I see. Aditya, you had one, Aditya. So, butchering yeah. your name, sorry. You can yeah. up later, Aditya. it's okay. Can I ask one more question? <laughs> Why don't we let these guys go first and then we'll come back to you. How's that sound? Yeah, cool. Uh, Yes. Yeah. So a lot of time we just see space exploration happening when, you know, like Earth is crumbled and the environment is all haywire. Yeah. <laughs> like obviously in the movies, that's the obvious case. So is that, is that any reason close to why we are planning to go and explore moon and then Mars? Uh, so I, I think for a lot of people, there is a question of, of hey, we're, we're not necessarily taking care of the planet, right? Um, I, and, and so they want to make sure over the next long term that there are alternatives uh, for places. That's not a really a, a near term uh, type of solution because, you know, you can obviously uh, fix a lot of things and we want to focus on that and make sure that the earth remains a, a viable place to live for a lot of people. Um, but you know, we want to think very far ahead, right? I mean, exploration is about finding uh, and putting a foothold in the far off places. And we don't know what we're going to find or use that for uh, in the time that comes. Uh, and so it's really more about exploration at this point. And uh, based on what happens in the years to come, we'll figure out uh, why why that's been important. And it's often probably not, it'll be a surprise, right? We we don't know what the future holds in a lot of ways. I don't know if Tuna, if you and Diane want to add to that. I would just say, you know, I mean, yeah, there, there's the old joke that, you know, the dinosaurs didn't have a space exploration program and look where they are now. And so there's, you know, there is obviously the, the threat of a, you know, extinction level event taking out humanity. And that's why you want to, you know, move out to other plants, stuff like that. But I think there's also the benefits we've seen over the decades of, you know, spin-offs from the the space program, you know, Apollo led to a lot of technology and innovation that um, helped spurn, you know, um, a lot of the technology in your phones and, you know, life-saving devices and all that. And so it, space exploration can be that engine of innovation to, to push forward as we move further out with humanity to then, you know, there's a lot of benefits in terms of spin-offs and technology development that are in your everyday life that come from the space program. So it's not about trying to find a new home um, because something's going to wipe us out here, but just, you know, we, we are in some ways a resource constrained planet, but we are a resource rich solar system. And it's just a question of moving out there and 
starting tapping into all that. Good stuff. Um, you know, I'm going to get one more because we're actually already over time and Himanshu, you have not gone yet. So go for it. Uh, right. I was reading about this uh, lunar gateway that is a, a mini space station near the a lunar orbit. So is it by any chance related to the Artemis uh, program? Yes. So the gateway is part of the Artemis program. Um, the, the components are being uh, manufactured now in terms of the power and propulsion and the halo module. And we're signing agreements with other um, countries as part of the Artemis Accords to be members of the gateway as well as the Artemis program overall. And that, that'll provide sort of a, a aggregation point in um, lunar orbit such that as the crews come from the earth, they can stop off at the gateway, pick up any supplies that maybe they couldn't bring with them on the Orion, whether it's spacesuits or, or other hardware the reusable lunar landers when we get to that point can aggregate there as well, um, meet at the gateway, be refueled as well, do some station keeping around there, pick up the crew, and then the crew goes down to the surface and stuff like that. So it's a, it's a mini space station in orbit around the moon to allow that point, um, a nexus point between the crews coming from Earth and the crews going up and down from the surface of the moon. Good stuff. I know we're over. Um, NASA team, if you guys give us like another 90 seconds, we'll, we'll tie it up. Um, you know, really, really great questions, you guys. And I'm sure, you know, we could probably go on for over an hour doing this. I really appreciate um, the generosity of the, the NASA team leading in and asking some of these questions. But Krishna, I want to come back to you um, through the lens of a parent. And, you know, you've got three amazing kids. What showed up for you in this webinar? It was just great to see the the creativity um, and it, it and the the attention to detail and the the real mm -hmm. science uh, that's gone into these submissions, and it's just a good reminder of you know the the power of the internet and where we are um, nowadays. That there's mm -hmm. so much so many resources available um, online, and um, you know people who are motivated and passionate, um, they can. Um, even as you know, quote unquote amateurs, they can do some amazing work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't have the internet. I had to go to the library and find the book. Um, and a lot of the advanced knowledge was hidden away in libraries and in universities. And nowadays, um, you know, you can learn almost anything. You can get very technical um, very quickly by finding stuff online. It's, it's a great time for STEM. Um, and it really democratizes innovation, engineering, and I'm really excited about it. So good job, everybody. That was really awesome. And mm -hmm. you know, keep, keep it up. Um, you know, there's a bright future for you guys. Good stuff. So uh, final thought on my end, you guys are so amazing. You guys are so cool. I'm just so excited to potentially host a follow-up webinar with you guys in a few years and learn how far your journey has gone. I mean, honestly, you guys, the, the possibilities for you are, are astounding and they're endless. Stay focused, dream big, the bigger, the crazier, the better. And I'll give you one piece of advice. Show up this inspired as you are at this webinar to everything you do in life. It'll be phenomenal, the journey that you're gonna go on. So once again, a huge congratulations to you guys, to all of our guests, NASA team, Christian, I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy schedules today. And, um, you know, make sure you check out the NASA website. There's so much more amazing stuff you can learn on STEM there. So if you're interested, go jump on there and learn. Um, and with that, I want to give everybody a huge thanks and thanks for joining today. Please stay safe. And depending on where you are in this big wide world, even if you're past your bedtime, Zeeson, um, have a wonderful morning, afternoon, or evening. Thank you so much, everybody. Bravo, guys. Good job. Good Bye. stuff. Bye. Bye. Nicely done. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.